So I want to start out by just going over some key characteristics of planets and also other solar system bodies that are really important in our study of comparative planetology. Um, and these are the following. Um, first of all, we want to know the size of an object, uh, both in terms of its mass and in terms of its radius. Using that, we'll be able to find the density of an object, and that's basically the amount of mass in a specific volume. Um, we want to know its orbital period, the time it takes to orbit the sun, its rotation period, which is the time it takes to spin once on its axis, and then its orbital tilt, which is um, the tilt away from the solar system's plane. Like we mentioned, the Earth's orbital tilt is 23 and a half degrees, and that's why the ecliptic, the path that the sun takes on the celestial sphere, is also tilted by 23 and a half degrees from our celestial equator. So all of these planetary characteristics, we'll use these to compare and contrast the planets. And using the patterns that emerge, we try to piece together a history of the solar system. So um, density and mass are very important concepts um, for comparative planetology. So let's say that I um, have 10 kilograms of feathers uh, and 10 kilograms of bricks. Um, they have equal mass. So if I was going to put them on a, you know, balanced scale, then they both have equal mass, even though we know that feathers are quite different than bricks, right? So the, the feathers, they have a much larger volume. They take up a lot more space to have the same amount of mass because they have smaller density. So this is just a simple example of density. Um, but when it comes to the planets, we use density in much the same way. If I have a planet that's made of light stuff, like gases, um, then it can be much larger, but still have an equivalent mass to a smaller object. So this is um, a really important concept. Density can tell us about the material. D the low density of feathers tells us that it, it's much fluffier, um, less compact of material than brick. So this is, um, one of the key concepts that we'll need for our comparative planetology. So I want to ask you a poll question about some of these items. Um, one of these characteristics is directly related to the distance of an object from the sun. So let me ask you quickly here, which one is that? Okay, so I am seeing the most votes for answer number three. And that's what I had in mind. The orbital period, P, is directly related to the distance from the sun, A. That is what, it, what Kepler's third law tells us. Um, so that's what's directly related to the distance from the sun. But it's also true that size seems to have something to do with distance from the sun, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are much smaller in size in terms of radius than Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, the density also seems to be different, right? The, the terrestrial worlds are smaller and more dense than those um, gas giants. So while these things are correlated with distance from the sun, they're not directly related in the same way that orbital period is. They're not directly governed by a law of physics in the same way that orbital period and uh, distance from the sun are. Okay. So um, when we look at our, our collection of solar system bodies, we can look at the data directly to try to make some um, observations about patterns. If we do go through the data, um, you probably saw from the reading, and that's why you answered the poll question the way that you did, um, that some of the planets are small in terms of both radius and mass. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the planets closest to the sun are very small whereas the gas giants are large. Um, there are some other objects that you could consider. Pluto used to be classified as a planet, now is classified as a dwarf planet. And there's another dwarf planet called Eris. Both of these are small in radius and mass, but they orbit, um, well, Pluto is beyond the orbit of Neptune. So you can start to see, you know, if we try to group planets based only on their radius and mass, um, there are some outliers. So Pluto would be an outlier there. If we group by density, then we have uh, rocky planets such as Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, um, very uh, low density planets such as the gas giants, and then Pluto and Eris are a little bit in between. They're more dense than the gas giants, but they're not quite as dense as the terrestrial worlds. 
And then finally, we can look at simply distance from the sun. And we would say those terrestrial planets are close to the sun and everything else is far from the sun. So you can see different objects end up in different groups. And so it's not totally clear how we um, group these objects. And that's why we've come up with the categories that we have. Um, so like I said, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, we call those terrestrial worlds. Terrestrial just meaning that they have a land surface. Um, so these are generally composed of rocky materials. Um, they have small atmospheres um, and they tend to be small. The gas giants, by contrast, they do have rocky and icy cores that are similar in size to the terrestrial planets, but they also have enormous atmospheres of gas. And that's where a lot of their mass is concentrated. And then finally, Pluto and Eris, those are also rocky and icy worlds, but they contain more ice than rock. So these end up being classified separately as dwarf planets. Um, and the difference between a planet and a dwarf planet is basically a dwarf planet is big enough to be round in shape instead of some you know, potato shape like lots of asteroids are, but they're still very small compared to other planets. And the key kicker for dwarf planets is they need to be able to dominate their orbit. And what that means is if there are two objects in the same orbital uh, distance and one of them is not much larger than the other, then it's gonna be a dwarf planet. So, you know, the Earth is much larger than its moon. So the Earth is a planet. It dominates its orbit. Uh, Pluto is not quite the same. Pluto has a moon called Charon that's almost, uh, it's quite a sizable object compared to Pluto. So here's some examples of dwarf planets. Um, Pluto is probably the one you've heard of, but there are a lot of other cool ones. So there's Ceres, Haumea, Makemake, and Eris. And I'm just comparing these here to some characteristics of Mercury and the moon. So you can see all of these are, are rather small objects. The dwarf planets are much smaller than even uh, the, our moon, but also compared to Mercury, our smallest planet. So they're small in diameter and looking at their density, um, water has a density of one in this graph, one gram per centimeter cubed. And if water has a density of one, more dense objects will be more rocky. Um, and so, if you look at the densities, the dwarf planets tend to have slightly more density than water. So they're, they're rockier than if they were made of pure water, uh, but they're not quite as rocky as our moon or as Mercury. So there's, you know, the pattern here suggests that dwarf planets have a pretty different history than the terrestrial worlds. And that's why we don't classify them as terrestrial planets even though they have solid surfaces, they have very different densities and sizes. Okay, so one of the reasons that they have a higher density than water is because they contain a lot of ice, um, ices. And by ices, astronomers don't just mean water ice, but also the solid versions of things that are normally gases on Earth. So things like methane and nitrogen are ices um, at the temperatures far, far from the sun where these objects orbit. All right, so if you wanna learn more, um, you know, we'll come back to some of these dwarf planets later on, um, but Ceres is our, um, a, a dwarf planet that actually lives in the asteroid belt, unlike Pluto, which is far beyond the orbit of um, Neptune. Uh, and it's a pretty cool object. Okay, so if we just classify things in the solar system based on their size, of course, the sun's going to be largest. Um, Jovian planets are smaller than the sun, but still quite sizable. Terrestrial planets are smaller, and dwarf planets are even smaller than that. So um, based on the data that you see here, and it's just fine if you guess, but consider carefully the numbers if you can, which type of planet would you think this would be and why? And I'm seeing a majority of votes for one, that this would be a terrestrial planet. That's what I had in mind too. Um, it's more dense than uh, water here. So it's not quite as dense as Earth. This is relative to water. And Earth has a density somewhere in the five point something range compared to water. So this would be something similar in mass to the Earth. Um, one of these should say radius at least. I don't know what happened here. So similar in mass, similar in radius, um, 
a little bit lower density than Earth, but if it's a such a small semi-major axis, this would probably be somewhere between um, Earth and the asteroid belt. So um, yes, I think based on all these properties, if we had some bonus planet in our solar system that we discovered with these properties, we would classify it as a terrestrial. Okay, so I want to mention a couple of different belts in the solar system. So I just mentioned the asteroid belt, and the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. It's a collection of obviously asteroids, um, and those never coalesced into a whole planet, or it could have been that they were, you know, planets that got broken up. So different origins for different asteroids. Uh, anyway, the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter, and Jupiter's gravity helps keep it there. We wouldn't have an asteroid belt otherwise. Um, and there's also a similar belt that you might not have heard of before called the Kuiper belt. And this is very similar to the asteroid belt, but it's out beyond the reaches of Neptune. And while it is similar in its structure to the asteroid belt, it's a collection of loose random objects. The objects that live out there are a little bit different than the asteroids. So Kuiper belt objects, we call these KBOs for short. They tend to be icy and rocky. So they're a mixture of ice and rock. Um, and a lot of these um, dwarf planets, such as Pluto, Charon, Haumea, Makemake, and Eris, those are all out there in the Kuiper belt. So most of our dwarf planets are out in the Kuiper belt. There's a couple in the asteroid belt, Ceres and Vesta, which are our largest asteroids. Um, and these Kuiper Belt objects are really important to study because they are they and the asteroids are some of the kind of raw stuff, the planetesimals that are left over from the formation of the solar system. So these also failed to become a planet. Um, why? I'm not sure. Actually, I do not know. Um, so the Kuiper Belt is hard to study because it's so far away, um, but it's really important to study. So there's a lot of cool science that's coming out about KBOs. All right, so there's kind of an overview of the solar system. We've got our terrestrial worlds, our asteroid belt, our Jovian planets or gas giants, and then our Kuiper belt. So if I put all of these now on our size classifications, um, dwarf planets and also moons of various planets, asteroids and KBOs, these are all smaller than terrestrial planets but they're larger than comets. So comets are another member of our solar system. They have highly eccentric orbits. Sometimes they're, they come very close to the sun, but most of the time they spend um, very far away, actually out beyond the Kuiper belt in a region known as the Oort cloud. So comets are basically just small chunks of ice in highly elliptical orbits. And then finally, the smallest stuff in our solar system is basically rocks and dust, stuff that's left over um, from the formation process, uh, and those are obviously the smallest pieces. Okay, so I want to talk about the composition. I kind of talked about this before, but I want to give sort of a visual for what, it, what is the composition of different objects. So the sun is mostly made of hydrogen gas, um, and it fuses hydrogen to helium in its core, so it's also got a good amount of helium. Um, the terrestrial planets are mostly made of rocky materials. And like we said, comets are totally made of ice. They're, they've got a little bit of dust on them. You can think of them as dirty snowballs. So the Jovian planets are mostly similar in composition to the sun. They also contain a lot of hydrogen and helium gas, but their cores also contain a little bit of rock and a little bit of ice. Asteroids are mostly made of rock, but they have a little bit of ice. Whereas dwarf planets are a little bit more evenly mixed, still tilting toward rocky. Moons are similar, and the Kuiper Belt objects are more icy than rocky. So asteroids and KBOs in terms of composition, asteroids are more rocky, KBOs more icy. So that's sort of the overview for composition. So now let me ask you, what do you think is the most important difference between moons and dwarf planets? Okay, I'm seeing the most votes for option number two, that the difference is it's what object they orbit around. And that's exactly right. So 
Our dwarf planets can be similar in size to a moon, similar in composition, but dwarf planets orbit the sun, whereas moons orbit a planet. All right, other question. What do you think is the most different, important difference between asteroids and dwarf planets? So here's your new poll. All right. So I'm seeing the most votes for five, followed by some votes for three. And I would say both of those are important in general. Um, some of the dwarf planets, like I said, are out in the Kuiper belt beyond the orbit of Neptune, but some of them are within the asteroid belt. So as actually asteroids and dwarf planets are not necessarily in different parts of the solar system. Some of those dwarf planets are in the asteroid belt. Um, but it is true that some of them are out in the Kuiper belt. So I see the temptation to answer three. But really the um, shape of these is the most important difference. Dwarf planets are defined by being round, but not dominating their orbit. Asteroids definitely don't dominate their orbit. There's tons of asteroids in the asteroid belt, um, but they're mostly shapes that most people compare to potatoes or uh, rocks. So asteroids tend to be kind of random lumpy shapes and dwarf planets are round. And that's a very key difference between them. 